Hey guys, thanks for being patient with me while I joined. All yeah, good. no problem. Nick, where are you based? I'm in Kansas right now. Oh, wow. Very cool. Yeah. And Max, you? Uh, New York City, right in Chelsea. Great. Well, we've got half the country covered. I'm in Miami. So I'll, awesome. I'll go ahead and kick off. Uh, the This panel is, is set to be really exciting. How blockchain technology is changing the way we view art and collect art. And so, Nick, I'll kick off with you because you've been highlighted in the press for pretty cool stuff. Uh, and so I want you to give an introduction of yourself, what you're building, and how we can support it. And then I'll pass it to Max. Yeah, so um, my first project in Web3 was called Floki. It was a um, meme coin, uh, like Dogecoin or Shiba Inu. We were, um, the community got to 350,000, um, 3 billion market cap in four months. So it was just a... Uh, Wow. Absolutely crazy. It's it's settled around um, half a billion um, for a while here in the in the bear market. But um, uh, but we exited that my partner and I um, about 14, 15 months ago and um, we started Web3 Gallery. One of the reasons we started is we felt like um, when we were at Floki, we had a really, really ridiculous marketing spend, like just crazy, crazy, because we had a really high tax and a lot of volume. Mm -hmm. um, but we just didn't really feel like a whole lot was converting. And we felt like we needed um, some ways to go out and grab users and kind of like uh, bring them into the space and make it like a fun and easy <clears throat> um, onboarding experience and then be able to remarket and all that. So um, and, and honestly, projects were just so hungry for stuff IRL at that point and just were so liquid. And so, um, we noticed, um, how well the like global crypto market responded to New York city, specifically like times square stuff, fifth Avenue stuff. So mm -hmm. we, we narrowed it down to times square and fifth Avenue. Uh, we went toward a bunch of spots and settled on fifth Avenue and just decided, well, this is kind of the retail, um, Mecca of the world. Uh, let's put a Web3 like electronics store here and kind of say, hey, the industry's arrived and make a statement and all that. And and the statement definitely worked. I mean, we had just most major companies you can think of come to us, you know, come tour a um, bunch of Fortune 500s, um, came and did technical tours, um, Department of Commerce um, for the United States, for example, um, you know, I could kind of go on and on with that, but, um, yeah. And then, um, it, it's been obviously a really fun journey and, uh, the market's been really turbulent. I think when we started web three gallery, uh, ETH was above 4,000. So, uh, and then when we opened, it was under a thousand. So, uh, <laughs> one of the worst, worst corrections, um, in any market. Um, so anyway, uh, but it's, it's been so fun. We've met some great people, um, Met a lot of really cool builders, met a lot of talkers, haven't really heard from those people so much the last four or five months. So it's really quieted down. And and we've um, as a company, we've um, we've been working on some some cool stuff that that I'm excited about. But anyway, that's that's kind of our story and, and how we ended up on Fifth Avenue and what we've been working on. So that's pretty cool. Thanks for walking us through that journey. We have Max Widmer here, um, who's a friend and uh, brand partner at Blockworks. Um, Max, can you talk about your journey? Uh, introduce yourself. Uh, tell us um, how much um, you're in the space um, outside of what someone would originally see uh, in Blockworks. They would, they would say, okay, you're a brand partner for Blockworks, but You've enlightened me and educated me on so much in the space of NFT. So I want the audience to kind of hear some some of the brilliance uh, because I definitely see it. So, well, thank you for that that grand introduction, Jante. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, Max, I've been in like officially in crypto for about a year, working with Blockworks, where I've kind of uh, rode the lightning as well, Nick, over the last uh, 12, 14 months. Um, but I've been 
kind of interested in this space on the periphery for about a year and a half. And that started with kind of paying attention to what was transpiring in this world of NFTs and why are people uh, buying JPEGs for a million dollars? <laughs> it was something uh, that I had completely written off. And, and like a lot of people, I, I thought it was worth like ridiculing and uh, what is this fad? Um, very quickly though, when I started paying attention to it, I realized there was a lot of substance here um, and a lot of really innovative technology that in, in my opinion is much more disruptive to um, the art space than I think a lot of people are are realizing right now um, with real long-term implications. So while we've seen uh, quite a lot of highs and lows this past year, um, I don't think this technology is going anywhere. And I think it opens up a lot of really, uh, really exciting conversations. I absolutely agree with you. So I have you two together here um, because I wanted a really robust panel. Um, Nick, you have an e-commerce and physical location. Um, Max, you are um, by day delivering news and insights at one of the biggest um, media companies in our space. And so you, you bring very different perspectives than Zenledger, we're software, we simplify crypto taxes. <laughs> and so um, we clearly have an audience of our customer base that focuses on NFTs, but let's, let's talk through the basics. Max, you hinted on this and Nick, you saw, saw this and started running with it. Let's talk about some of the, the FUD, the fear that's been in the market. And then let's talk about the realities of the technology, because Max, you hinted on this. It's not just JPEGs. Um, but there's a lot of, I would say, headline news and media that talks just about kind of the rug pulls or the apes or uh, whatever cool kind of image is, is out there. And so let's kind of ground the audience in kind of what we see and the potential we see of this tech from both of you guys. I, I'd love to hear both of your perspectives. Yeah, Nick, you want to take that one first? <clears throat> yeah, so um, we were... We were super into the um, onboarding users side um, IRL for a while. We did that six month pilot on Fifth Avenue and wrapped that up before the end of last year. Um, I think it really, I mean, we're, we're, you're talking about a few things here, but definitely the uh, sensationalism and media it makes it really tough um, to get new things off the ground these days and totally understand the kind of business model and, and what works and what people share and it's just, it's just kind of crazy how it works. But um, definitely when someone walked in on fifth Avenue, they thought everything had just blown up and there was nothing left <laughs> uh, from what they read. And so it's just so funny, especially after FTX. I mean, it was, it was just like, you have to take someone, you know, imagine, you know, the first time you walked into a Best Buy and you just were excited about the tech, you wanted to get like a laptop or something. You wanted to get in and try it out and do some, you know, use the tools. The, the tech is just as just as helpful for people. Uh, there, there's, you know, equal uh, market share opportunities. Industry size is, is, is slotted even be bigger than current tech market. And so it's like it's like walking into an electronics store early, um, except, you know, we have a m much more, uh, you know, dominant kind of news cycle world and information spreads much more quickly. And, um, and so it's just, it's just different. There's different challenges. Um, we, what we noticed is that people really liked going through things in groups. Uh, so guided tours worked really, really well. Um, and so if we are uh, to scale the retail operations, which it looks like we will at some points, um, um, timing wise, um, differs, or, you know, could change, but, um, it'll be a guided tour deal around 20, 25 minutes where you'll be, you'll make money, um, on the deal. Companies are willing to pay for onboarding customers, getting people to understand what, what they have on their phone and, and why it's important and how they could use it. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, so those are all things. And then there's just a ton of like sociology and psychology we could get into, um, of why, why is web three going to take over so many industries? 
Uh, we haven't had like our chat GPT moment yet where everyone's like, oh, wow. Like, yeah, this is cool <laughs> crap. but I mean, that's definitely coming. I mean, you know, most smart people in the world have admitted publicly that the technology is going to change everything we do. Um, and so we're just, we're just still working on that. <clears throat> um, and uh, yeah. And honestly, um, Zen Ledger, you know, being a kind of like a, I think you call it a boring tax software or whatever. That's, that's actually really important piece is like that part's extremely confusing. It's way, way more confusing than before when you have all these different currencies, especially on the business side. Uh, so, you know, you're definitely um, a part of the, of the equation. So anyway, that's, that's, a, those are my first thoughts. And Thanks. Appreciate that. Max, anything that? Yeah. Um, I agree with you, Nick, on, on all fronts. Um, I think the first thing to kind of address is I think there's still a massive misunderstanding about what an NFT is um, and what the potential of an NFT is, uh, especially insofar as the art conversation is concerned. Um, most people you ask still think an NFT is an overpriced JPEG and why would you pay for that? And a lot of the uh, kicking while the industry has been down, I think is warranted because whenever you have something where a lot of people are making a lot of money really quickly and saying things on Twitter, like have fun staying poor and you're not going to make it when <laughs> those same, uh, when those same things uh, inevitably crash in price, a lot of people are celebrating that and they're, happy that that fad has passed quickly. Yeah. Um, but I don't think it has. I think when you look at this, not just as a JPEG and you view it more as a access key to a community um, with a specific artist, that's when you can start to kind of reimagine, well, what does it mean to be a collector of art or what does it mean to be a buyer of art? Um, and some of those conversations, I think, are just heating up. And as you said, Nick, like it's not going anywhere. So I'm really excited about what the next phase of this looks like now that um, we've cleared out maybe a lot of the tourists or the people who are more on the speculative side. I think those are great points. I, I completely agree with you, Max. I think to your point, there's there's a rewriting of the rules. Collectors once viewed art as this static physical thing and of course you had varying types of mixed media that kind of brought that art to the i would say to the eye in a different format in a different fashion but this is a new level and so as a collector what do you think about value um, if I collect and decide that I really love this NFT work, how do I think about value? Is it something I should think about? Um, because that I think that perspective could change uh, a collector's mindset versus that JPEG that's this, oh, well, I can download it, I can send it to someone else. It's not just that. And so you have to value that differently. Complete, completely agree. And I think um, that conversation of, about value, <laughs> when you hold an NFT, um, I think you can think of it like you're a shareholder in that artist or you're a unique shareholder in that artist. And yeah, that specific token may be a picture of an ape or a cartoon. But really what it is, is it's a unique uh stake in that artist that has value um, that's increasing and decreasing depending on how successful and or how much potential that artist might have. So what this is doing now, and if you think back to movements in art throughout history, this is the first time that it's kind of democratizing the ability to have a stake in an artist as they're upcoming. Um, and as maybe they're gaining more notoriety. And I think that's a really exciting concept, but it's not something we've experienced before. So a lot of people are just unsure what to make of this. Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant point. Go ahead, Nick. Yeah. Um, I, I like that perspective. I think that that's the thing is you can, I mean, let's go back to human psychology. So I'll, I'll tell you a crazy stat. Um, we're looking at uh, Gen Z younger generation, kind of millennials, but mostly Gen Z, the, the generation that's really jumped on this thing. 
um, they quit sports at the highest rate of any generation of all time. And the reason they do is because uh, they're not having fun. And if you ask them why they're not having fun, um, most of their parents think it's because they're not winning, but they actually want to contribute to a win. So that's like the huge issue is they're not contributing when their team's winning. They're not a part of the team. And so we have this generation that grew up in creator economy with YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, all that, TikTok. And they're just used to contributing and being a part of something and being able to chip in. And so now they have these demands and they're only going to get bigger because now we have this concept of contributing and owning. And so it's just, it's much better. It's way more interesting for people. Um, people are really losing a lot of uh, care for loyalty programs and all these things that companies roll out to try to create fake relationships with us. The virtual signaling stuff just doesn't work. It's just crap. Uh, the future is, um, like Max said, you actually have a piece of something you feel like a part of the community and you can actually make a difference and make an impact. And so things, things need to be voted on. There needs to be zero knowledge proof, zero knowledge community stuff. That, that is where you get to this $13 trillion market economy by 2030. So that's, that's like a lot's going to change. It's like, I think this Max just hit the first step. It's like, I got a piece of art given from uh, my wife's grandfather. I didn't like it accidentally fell and a piece of paper fell off the back of it. I never would have saw that it was like a one of 50 thing. And I see the certificate from way back and I'm like, oh, that's cool. Like it was a part of this, but that, that's kind of it. Um, and uh, that's super inefficient. That's just so bad. You know, mm -hmm. it's like when we invented email, there was all this friction and everyone was still spending multiple years writing letters, putting the stamp on it, sending it out. It's just so bad. Uh, but it just took us a while to realize how good that is. And so that's, that's really good. Like knowing that you actually own something that it's apart from this, whatever it's, it's a collection of X, his stuff usually goes for this or, or, um, whatever the artists. Uh. So, um, and that could be, you know, you could open the doors for a lot of things, you know, um, clubs, yeah. clubs were extremely popular, um, you know, with our like great grandparents and grandparents, and now they're coming again to be really popular again. Um, I think, you know, public enemy and number one in the U S might be Mark Zuckerberg or, or close to it, but like, uh, we're kind of tired of this, like centralized world. That's like really yeah. top down. And so it's, it's a really, it's an upside down. It's a, it's a total reboot. Um, you know, the reason why I feel like it'll be young entrepreneurs rising up and innovating is because that's how it works. I mean, uh, if you, if you read the book, the innovators dilemma, or look at these waves and cycles, uh, there's a reason why, you know, AT&T sold patent for the portable radio. They thought it sucked. They thought no one would like it. They were out of touch. Their board members were 78 years old and had no clue. They thought everyone's just going to sit in their living room, listen to this huge radio that's clear in $5,000 or whatever. But no, there's a whole new generation that wants to walk around with them. And obviously that innovated into, into the smartphone today. And now, now this whole, whole future of blockchain technology and, and uh, decentralization. So great point. I'd like to expound upon that because you, you touched on something that I think is super important, meaning that contribution and that creator economy. And so as we think about communities, for example, if I own a Rothko, I know that's a very expensive piece of physical artwork. And as I try to understand who else owns a Rothko, that's a very um, clubby in a different way, but sometimes opaque, I would say often opaque type of collection. I need to probably network in a very different way than I would if I owned a piece of work from Amber Victoria or uh, if I owned a doodle. Max, can we talk about the communities yeah being created, being, being frankly scaled instantly. And Nick, you talked about this, how quick your community grew, but Max, like, what are you seeing, especially right uh, in New York and, and some of the, the hubs? Yeah, I think the, the innovation that's happening around the community creation is something that's vastly overlooked in the NFT space right now. And the fact that, you know, what does it mean to network with other people? What are the ties that bind us to other people. Well, 
typically it's been like where you went to college or the neighborhood you're in. But why shouldn't something you care deeply about, like your preferences in art or the, I mean, the type of art you buy, if you're not purely a speculator, and a lot of people are in the NFT space, but a lot of times that's a very personal decision. You buy a piece of art because you connect with it at a deeper level. What does that connection mean? I'm, I don't really know, but I'm interested in other people who maybe feel the same way or have the same taste in art that I do. And I think what's happening with a lot of these NFT projects right now, or at least the ones I believe are doing it right, is they're now harnessing these communities in really interesting ways. Um, having that token, which is maybe like the access key, well, that's just the start. Now there are continuing benefits that come with, again, being a stakeholder and that artist. Maybe it means once a year you're airdropped a custom piece. You don't even have to pay for it, but just by being a holder, you now refresh your wallet one day and you have a new piece of art that's in, that's now has its own value. We saw that with like Bored Apes and Mutant Apes, which were mm -hmm. selling for tens of thousands of dollars. And those were airdropped for Bored Ape holders in some cases. So again, the use cases here are really interesting. And I think what's starting to happen as well, which Nick, obviously you're right on the cutting edge of this, is you're, you're now getting that in real life component as well. So it's not just a digital front, but it's also... What type of events do you have access to? Are there physical merch drops that that artist has also created that now you can purchase as a result of having that token? Um, so again, I think the possibilities are kind of endless and we're just getting started in figuring out uh, which direction this heads in. That's great. Nick, can you talk about your community and and and, and the evolution? Yeah, so uh, back when we were with Floki, I mean, one of the most shocking things is when we realized that people were just hanging out in the chat. I mean, people were literally dating people, people were meeting people, people were uh, joining up. There were tons of subgroups created. Um, you know, we're inserting the word art in here. It, it almost feels a little forced because that, that part's just kind of like a secondary thing. What mm -hmm. we're talking about is, um, what we're talking about is a whole, a whole new wave where data will not be the most valuable asset anymore. It'll be communities and the ability to get people rowing in the same direction. I mean, look at what GameStop did. Look at what we're doing solving crimes with communities. Uh, it's just it's just very, very early days of that. And so I think, like I said, this bottom um, this this bottom up world um, where um, we can take kind of power from the top, spread it among the people. It wasn't possible before today, um, you know, and it's still not even really possible. It's getting there. It's getting closer all the time. That ERC uh, 4337 was was a big advancement, but we still have to build a lot of cool tech on top of, uh, with that kind of infrastructure framework. But um, honestly, the, the reason why Web3 Gallery rolled up into We3 Group, which now owns uh, several different companies, is we just realized it's it's you got to do you got to go really big and you got to do some really cool things and they all have to be around uh, building really large communities. And honestly, the, the major, major item that we see that having the most success in the future is around causes, uh, something that people are already passionate about. If you can unite people globally around something that they already believe in, uh, that they care about, uh, a lot of times that things that people will die for um, or, or at least will sacrifice a lot for. Um, that, that can be really powerful because, I mean, it's all about who you know. Um, the chances that my I'm going to meet a great friend here in Kansas are very, very low. Um, but if I'm thinking globally, there's a much, much higher chance that I can find someone that has similar interests that, you know, maybe similar intellect or humor or whatever, and I can be great friends with them. And so this there's just it's a great connecting tool. And one plus one can equal three. And honestly, th this is the easy one. I used to teach economics at a university for half a semester. I, uh, I kind of threw in the towel when I got all the papers to grade. Uh, but anyway, um, the an economy is healthy because money moves. Um, if, if, if no money moves, an economy is dead. Um, so we want money to move. And if assets are all digital or we start to move more and more towards digital assets, they can move more freely. And so economies will be more successful. And so this is, you're talking about changing economy. So that's, that's why, it, you know, honestly, some of these conversations, they just start, people want to pick our brain about art or IRL, you know, galleries or whatever. It's just, it's just like, it's 1% of what we're talking about here. It's, yeah. it's a piece. It's for sure a piece. And there's riches in the niches. 
and and we we were able to kind of claim the crown of maybe top NFT gallery or one of the top in the world. And that, that's awesome. And we talked to a lot of major companies, but these major companies are dumping big, big money. They're really worried that they're not going to figure it out in time and things are going to change and consumer behavior is already changing. Max, I want to open it up to you to ask Nick any questions. I know um, just Web3 Gallery and, and We3 Group is such a, uh, I would say, emerging force that I know Max has some questions uh, that he would love to, to pick your brain. And, and, and I say that because when I come to New York City, Nick, I'm, I'm showing up to the gallery because um, I have, I have, you know, uh, kind of a passion for it. And I definitely want to see it. I, I don't want to burst your dreams, but uh, temporarily closed, but we can, we can chat about that. We actually okay. have really cool stuff open enough, but okay. in this market, in this market we, there's no need to be on Fifth Avenue. Okay. All right. Yeah. Um, Nick, I wanted to ask you, like, where, where do you think we are on the adoption curve of like the traditional art world taking this seriously? or start to start accepting digital art and or kind of NFT art as something worth uh, showcasing. Like I know Jonathan and I were speaking earlier, I think there's an exhibit at the MoMA right now. It's like one of the first main digital art exhibits, but, but what is your, what's your outlook on that? So I'll give you some numbers. So global art market 2021, that's the last number 65 billion, uh, NFT market that same year, 25 billion. Uh, so it's already, and, and that was a 2500 X from 2020 for NFTs. So it's already, uh, you know, whatever, uh, John Tay's the, the math guy here, you know, 40% of the value, something like that. I kind of see him as Bitcoin and Ethereum right now, it's just as far mm -hmm. as like valuation. Um, <clears throat> so Ethereum's catching up. I mean, a lot of people think that, you know, Ethereum will, will flip Bitcoin and all that, but that's, that's a completely different conversation. But, um, that I think it's just, you're talking about a, like, let's just say New York. Average art collector in New York spends 740000 a year, I believe, on art. Um, they spend a lot of money. Um, they're probably spending $0 on digital uh, collectibles. The whole $25 billion, most of the $25 billion has come from, from people like me and you, Max, people that really weren't big art collectors before. And this is kind of our first kind of run, and this is the new cool thing. So uh, what we're seeing is that the people that represent the top collectors in the world, they're getting asked about it all the time from collectors. They don't know what to tell the collectors. Uh, mm -hmm. It's too risky for them to recommend things because they don't know what they're talking about. And so, um, but it, it's coming. Um, the Belvedere Museum is really like a NFT for, forward. Um, they're in Austria. We've had a lot of talks with them. They've, they've done their own collection. Uh, Sotheby's and Christie's are, I, I know we're, we're working on a really high end NFT to auction this year. We had to fight them to death for it. They were just fighting for it really hard. Um, they had, a, I think, a 5.3 and a 5.4 million auction last year, uh, NFTs. Uh, but, and we know both the guys that bought those, and they were really frustrated with how, um, you know, the Christie's and Sotheby's kind of handle these things. And they're still learning and figuring it out. And so um, it, it's just, um, it, it's going to definitely flip traditional art market. I mean, it doesn't make any sense. Traditional art, you have to fly this guy in from Europe with the magnifying glass and the little briefcase to figure out if it's a real piece or not. I mean, with, with NFTs, you just you just click on the profile picture and it tells you everything you need to know about it uh, with Twitter blue or any of that stuff. So. Uh, I, also, I also think do not take this seriously is do completely like overlook the issue of the fact there are digitally native artists who are creating really powerful work and so what do you do with that as a collector how do you transfer that what does the value exchange look like what does the authentication look like um i follow uh an up-and-coming artist uh by the name of aaron alto and he actually he did like the cover of balaji's book the network state um, but he's taking a lot of really interesting projects but all of his art is digitally native and he's doing drafts like he's over in florence right now doing a bunch of early drafts the same way that Da Vinci and Michelangelo and Galileo would draft on their notebook, but all of it is done digitally. He's doing it on basically an iPad. Um, so I think there's this emerging demographic of artists who are just as, if not more talented than people who have come before, but their work exists on the internet. So what do you do with that dilemma? I think blockchain technology is what you do with it. 
Um, and I think a lot of people are just like discounting that or not paying close enough attention to it. Yeah. And I think Max, to piggyback there, um, the PFP thing. So, I mean, we think of PFPs as like uh, board apes and all that. And, you know, I know they get made fun of a lot, but there's a really interesting dynamic here. You know, you, you, um, <clears throat> when someone DMs us with a high value PFP, we treat them completely differently. It's hard not to. It's, it, it says so much about the person. If you owned, if you owned a restaurant and someone walked in wearing a Patek Philippe on their wrist, you would know exactly. that they were going to spend a lot of money on a bottle of wine, most likely. Exactly. Right? Yeah. yeah. Max, and I know you dress to that caliber. How often are you wearing that bracelet to restaurants? Probably not very often, right? But how often are you on social media? Uh, so, I mean, it just makes way more sense. It's And the, how many people can you get in front of at any given time? If exactly. you're wearing a nice watch, you might be in a room full of 50 people at a networking event. If you have a PFP of a board ape, that's going out to millions of people. And immediately that designates your signal in that community. Yeah, so, yeah, that's, so the, that's a great yeah, point. You know, you think about investments in that that community. It's so global right now, to your point, Nick. You know, you don't need to fly over. Like, you can see it instantly, and I can be wherever. And I think that is is something that we take for granted, but then you have to step back and, and also say that everything gets publicized. So the wins get publicized, the great artists get publicized, the rug pulls get publicized. And so we kind of soak it all in at the same point. Totally. Yeah, I think um, we're, you know, the, the question here is how blockchain technology is changing the way we view and collect art. I think people are going to collect art that never would have um, ever. I mean, I, I wouldn't have been an art collector, but now I am. Um, and, and the reason is because it's going to get them, uh, it's going to help them climb in life. And, and people that are ambitious are going to want to do it. People that are speculative are going to want to do it. People that are friendly are going to want to do it. People that are social are going to want to do it. People that are anti-social are going to want to do it. People that are pro-government, anti-government. I mean, there's going to be reasons to join in with people that are similar to you. It's, it's the same thing we've always done. It's just the digital version. We're spending eight and a half, nine, ten hours a day on on devices. Why why are we not like you know? For example, we're all on video calls all day long. Why are we not monetizing things on the background? Why are we not monetizing uh, different filters and so on and so forth? Why are things not sellable, yeah. transferable? Yeah. So and, and it's all coming to to expand on that, like we're when we're talking about this conversation surrounding NFTs. We're specifically talking about art as in like digital images, but this extends to any creator, any musician, any any artist who's creating any type of output uh, can now, you can have a stake in that type of creator. So if there's an up and coming band and maybe I'm a token holder of that band, well, if they have a meteoric rise and I was an early believer or an early investor through having maybe one of their PFP tokens, I don't know. Well, now I've charted their course um, and I'm reaping the benefits of that as someone who can now sell that token once that band gets successful. It's kind of an arbitrary example, but I think these are just very new mechanisms of investing in things that you care about and love and believe in besides the speculative front. Yeah, it's a, it's a great point. It's also something that hints and real more so screams at the accessibility of the art we see today the way we view art the way we collect art well we view it all the time to your point nick and we collect it at varying price points and so you don't have to be intimidated by walking into a gallery and not seeing a price tag <laughs> asking the question and then getting frankly embarrassed uh at the price point or just saying I love this, but there's no way it, it's not going to, you know, there's no way I can collect that. I can't own a piece of that. And I think that dynamic is, is definitely transformational. Yeah, Max, you made a good point as well. And um, those are, those are all good points. I mean, another evolution that I really like Max and we've been working on pretty heavily is um, what if you identify anybody that's successful early? Uh, what if you identify athletes early? What if you identify artists, musicians, social influencers? 
um, business people. I mean, the, if you kind of set those that like digital asset infrastructure, it's so much more efficient and you could split yeah. it up a million ways and you could do it on chains where it doesn't cost a penny. And it, it what it will make you do, Max, is you've got this artist friend that you like, or maybe he's not a friend, maybe he's a friend, maybe not. You're just following him. It'll it'll incentivize you uh, when you're talking to your friend at Disney uh, to get to get Aaron's artwork over there because you're a holder and he's going to do it through your uh, spot on the chain or whatever, and yeah. everybody wins. Yeah. Well, and and I have a stake in the success of that person I'm supporting now, quite literally. So as opposed to buying an expensive T-shirt at a concert or exactly. I'm, I'm literally a stakeholder in that creator. Um, and I also just would like to speak a bit more. I, I completely agree with you, Nick. Like I was not someone who ever collected art prior to NFTs. And I think having a being a unique owner of a piece, it, it, it changes your relationship with art a bit because now that's something you've selected and, and you have ownership over. Um, but there's also, to your point, Jante, like the, the entry point is low. You don't need to be in a certain income bracket to do this. I, I think one of the projects I've been paying close attention to is the Open Edition Checks project that Jack Butcher just released a couple of weeks ago. And just kind of quick context into what this is. He riffed on the whole idea of being verified on Twitter for $7.99. So he basically did an Open Edition where for $7.99 or 0 0.0001 ETH, whatever it was, you could buy basically a almost like a Warhol soup cans check bracket. So it would show a bunch of Twitter checks in a bunch of different colors. And again, it was seven bucks. So if you thought this was interesting, you could do it. The project took off to the point where I think they were selling for two or three Ethereum a week or two later. So whatever that is, 100x, 200x gains, but also just a really interesting social commentary that now anyone could be a part of. You didn't have to be able to afford a million dollar Warhol painting. So I think these, they're just interesting how these rules are starting to. And, and again, Max, if you go, if you rewind back, it came from something Elon did with his couple hundred million followers or whatever, which is the same thing Floki was born from and the same thing Dogecoin rallies on. So really the real asset here is community. It's having those hundred million people kind of united around the same kind of thing or whatever. And you could even do really well in the riffs of it. Um, so that's, to me, that's the most valuable assets of the future. And the most exciting thing, yeah, is the community part. How can you bring people together, um, make them stronger together? I mean, it shouldn't be your dad went to Harvard and he, he makes a few phone calls and you're successful or whatever. I mean, there's just, we're just, we can be way past that. Yeah, I think, I think you're right. Judging a, a piece of work. Um, and Nick, to your point, it's bigger than just art. Judging a community as something you want to ascribe or be a part of, I think that's the takeaway. I think, I think the takeaway is I don't necessarily need to come at this price point to be a holder of this. I can find the work, find the community, find the project that I'm most interested in, and I take away as well as add so much value to that, that it makes it worth it for me without having to like part with cash to kind of be in this like, yeah, uh, in this collector group. Yeah. And furthermore, Max, you want the headline here. Uh, F Facebook's owned community for a long time. They will not own it in the future. L look up organic reach right now, Facebook groups, 2.2%, 2.2%, which means if you have a group of 30 million, it's actually only a group of 700,000. That's insane. Uh, we have groups, we've talked to groups of 30 million plus that used to be the most engaged groups in the world that used to get millions per post of likes. And now they're getting one, two, 3,000 likes per post. I mean, you have to pay to play. It is mm -hmm. totally top down. W what about the community? Shouldn't they be able to reach each other and unite and do cool stuff? Mm -hmm. No, he doesn't care. I mean, Zuckerberg doesn't give a crap about that. It's, mm -hmm. it's shareholder owned. Yeah. And I think people are completely underestimating the strength of these communities. Um, like you, you take the board ape example, which is the, the easiest one to rag on because a lot of people say, well, I don't want to be associated with anyone who would spend a million dollars on a picture of yeah. um, a monkey. But at the same time, a lot of those people didn't spend a million dollars on that picture. They spent $200 on that picture because they believed yeah. in the concept very early on and now they're rewarded handsomely for it. So now you have a community of 10,000 people 
who have this really interesting connective tissue. And you better believe they're going to kind of fight tooth and nail to maintain the value. Of that. So what happens when you have a decentralized system that incentivizes that a value stays, you know, that a value stays consistent or increases? It's it's kind of like uncharted territory that we're entering, I think. And it's really yeah, exciting. It's fascinating. Yeah, I, think, I think the question, Max, is who's more powerful, the, the board ape holders or the founders? And in the in the past world, it would have been founders every time. But now it's definitely the holders, in my opinion, definitely the holders. Uh, that, that only get bigger and bigger. Maybe one last topic, and I think, hey, if we if we go over, maybe this is not the last topic, but um, I want to talk about FOMO. I want to talk about how communities and that energy that those communities throw off have been so instrumental in bringing attention, for example, the community of apes or whether it's Yuga Labs or or other communities. And then others, literally the term is now ape into um, that project because it looks cool. There's so much energy. Like, is that is that something that is, is it positive for the space that that folks feel like they, they've missed out on the price gains and therefore they need to jump in? Or should we be thinking about this very differently? We think that. <laughs> my, my cautiously optimistic perspective on this is that we're, we've made it through the worst in terms of NFT speculation and FOMOing. I think like in 2021 specifically and early in 2022, there was just so many people making so much money so quickly off some of these assets that the flywheel of that was spinning off so many similar projects. So you couldn't really discern if it was legit or not. And so everyone was just saying, why not take some of these poker chips I just won off my ape and throw them off every project I can invest in. I do think with the past year in crypto, um, a lot of the tourists have fleed and you have more of a serious collector or a more discerning collector who's navigating the space. Um, that's not to say there still won't be uh, scams and fraudulent plays and overhyped projects. I mean, that, you're seeing it with the open editions now where all of a sudden every week there's a new open edition because a couple of these have been successful. But I think, um, I don't know, I think there's always gonna be a certain extent of FOMOing and uh, <laughs> you know misplaced bets, but I, I, I hope that we're past the worst of that. I think that we are. You could, you might completely disagree now. <laughs> no, I completely agree. Um, you know, it's one of those things that's in that kind of negative category that I try to steer away from because uh, there's so much attention already on it. But um, Max, you hit it on the head. A lot of that's completely gone. Um, you know, influencers. Um, I mean, at a certain point, at NFT could sell out any collection, and then you know, it just kind of blew up on them or whatever. But um, you know, now influencers have a lot less influence, so. That stuff doesn't work as much anymore. The if you go back to the beginning, you know, like I've been talking about, if we really want to study this thing, it's dopamine. I mean, it's dopamine is what gets us fired up to do pretty much everything in our life. It's uh, it's the anticipation that something good will come, and so that's that's what employers do to us. That's what um, people we're attracted to do to us. I mean, that's that's kind of what motivates us. That's what coaches do to us, um, and I think. Um, there is going to be dopamine, uh, for sure. Um, it's, it's kind of always motivated us and, uh, and got us to do cool things and innovate and, uh, and to speculate. I mean, speculative markets have been around since the very beginning. I mean, stock markets started by people speculating on shipping, shipping, uh, ships in London or something like that. I mean, that, and it, it blew up, became a big company, uh, cause a bunch of people speculated. Here's a crazy one. I, um, um, was it Thomas Edison, the light bulb? He announced it, I think, four years before he actually figured it out. <laughs> so everybody kind of got fired up and started throwing money at him and stuff. And then he kind of used that money to figure it out. So, I mean, people have been playing these games for a long time. It's not, nothing changed. We're humans. Hum, human error is a real deal. The tech is is unbelievable. Yeah. Uh, we just scratched the surface of it today. Um, you know, I, I gave my example of I, I don't believe Facebook's going to own community much longer. I think communities are going to own community. And so that's, to me, that's the main theme. And honestly, what we're investing our time and resources towards right now, we three group is, is, uh, how can we, how can we help communities, uh, own their future and people yeah. own their future yeah. and how can we support a bottom up world? And I'll tell you the best developers in the world will even join you if that's your mission. 
Yeah. And that's why they're leaving Facebook and Google and all these companies because they just don't believe in it anymore. Yeah. I think yeah. that's a great spot. Max, I'll let you finish your point. No, I was just going to just, I completely agree with everything Nick just said. And I do think the dopamine rush is absolutely part of this. The, the, there is a level of gambling and trading and speculating that makes it kind of fun, but I don't think that discounts the authenticity of the art that you're investing in. So I, I think if, if you could take a, I don't know, a Renaissance art collector in the early 20th century who had 200 paintings in his house and with the click of a button, he could swap those and sell them and exchange them for another one. That person would probably have a lot of fun. It doesn't mean they're not a serious art collector. It actually yeah. means they're probably someone who's more serious about um, yeah. where value lies. And now we have those technological rails built out. And to your point, Nick, people are, the, the younger generation is a digitally native generation. This is what they're accustomed to. So a lot of the people who are the main um, objectors of NFTs or the people who kick it while it's down are folks, quite frankly, who are not being open-minded about how uh, art and technology has always evolved and will continue to. Thanks, Mac. I think as we close, I love that energy, innovation, lean on in the tech, the communities, own the community to your point, Nick. That's I think super exciting and that's the future. And I wanna thank both of you for taking your time. Um, I think this panel, we could talk <laughs> for an hour. So um, I'll close here, but I look forward to uh, to seeing you both in person uh, very soon here. And maybe we'll we'll kick off another panel and, and, and talk about other points. So. Thanks, John. Thank you so much. Uh, Max, uh, I'll hit you on LinkedIn. Yeah, please do. All right, the community starting. It was a new community. Yeah, <laughs> there we go. See, you. appreciate you. Bye. Yeah. Bye.